What's up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Variant the Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Eris Quinones, with co-host Tim Conley. What's up, Tim? What's going on, everybody? How have you been living this past week or so? I feel I like how even though we talk, obviously, throughout the week, I'm always like checking in on you, like <laughs> with the audience. <laughs> yeah, we we um because what he's saying is he knows how I am. Is what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> this is for your benefit. Uh, yeah, no, doing doing great, man. Everybody, uh, just like everybody else, just plugging along. We live in a crazy world, just going day by day. Uh, how about you? How's everything in your house? Things have been. It's it's so weird. Like things have been kind of crazier than ever right now. As far as you know, we're getting trying to get super ahead with uh, with variant. And then I have a personal project that I'm working on. That's like in full swing busier than ever with that and then on top of all that dealing with uh uh the pandemic and uh my wife about to give birth to uh a new baby amidst all the chaos in the world and everything else going on so which by far is the most stressful part for for sure and it's 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 a lot but uh (laughs) it is what it is that's right we just got to keep moving just keep swimming just keep swimming. Dude, I, I I tell that to myself all the time. Dory is constantly in my head. <laughs> Ellen would be very proud. <laughs> well, today we thought it'd be fun that each of us give uh, our two favorite rivalries in comic books. Now, with that said, we are not going to include Batman and the Joker because that right. at, that's so cut and dry, so obvious. And everyone knows that would definitely be one of mine, being the big Batman fan that I yeah, am. So it would probably be both of them. Right, one. yeah. So we're going to exclude that and uh, pick. Uh, we're each going to pick two other ones that's not Batman or the Joker. <laughs> right. <laughs> so think of it like a pyramid. For sure. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Joker, Batman at the top, and then it's just splintering in two different directions Ooh. from there. Indeed. So... Let's get into it. Do you want to kick it off? Um, you know, actually, I want you to, to kick. You want it me off to kick it off? I don't. I, yeah, because you know, I'm going to use your 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 wording as inspiration oh. for my first. Okay, all right. You know, I need I, I need see, to feel inspired. I, I was trying today. to be polite. And I'm look feeling at that. tired. <laughs> all, right. all right. So my first one is going to be Flash and Reverse Flash, specifically Barry Allen and Eobard Thawne. Now, this is solid selection. Yeah, this is. I don't think a lot of people know. I said it on the show before, but I don't know, you know, if I've said it several times. Anyway, the Reverse Flash, specifically Thon, is my second favorite villain in comics, period. And here's why. <laughs> this is why this is one of my favorite rivalries, because it's such a complex one, right? Like, all great rivalries are because, oh, yeah. you know, they're tied to the origins of the characters, or there's something there that makes it super personal, right? Mm-hmm. And with Reverse Flash, specifically Thon, Reverse Flash, when I say Reverse Flash for the remaining of, of me talking about him, no, I'm talking about Thon, because there's <laughs> been several, um, is Thon was basically, he's like from the future, right? And he's right. like a fan of... The Flash. He was visits. He visits like the Flash Museum and all that. Like he basically looks up to him. He wants to be the Flash. Right. So he's like, so you know, to to really give you like the nitty gritty of it or like a b- super brief, vague summary of it. He basically is a, just obsessed with the Flash. Wants to be him so much so that he eventually, you know, becomes this crazy fan that starts, you know, attacking Barry Allen when he feels rejected from mm-hmm. him. Pretty much, you know, because his history is really mm-hmm. convoluted. We've talked about it in the History of Reverse Flash episode and some other episodes uh, when uh, Josh Williamson redid his uh, his history and stuff like that. So we've talked about it on the show. So if you want to know his his origin and his history of how that all works out, you could uh, search for it on our channel, History of Reverse Flash. And then I believe, I don't know what the other one is. Just type in Reverse Flash <laughs> on the Variant YouTube channel and you'll, you'll find <laughs> you it. You can't go wrong. You'll find it, right. But uh uh, to not get into all that confusing stuff because time travel and all that stuff. Uh, essentially, he to to get back at the Flash for feeling like rejected and and all that stuff. Uh, he does you know the worst thing you could do to someone, right? Kill one of your loved ones, which you know the closest loved ones to you usually is your parents or your wife or right. kids. Those you know those are usually going to be like the person you're closest to uh, or love most mm-hmm. in life. And in uh, Reverse Flash's case, he went after Barry's mother. Now, the crazy thing about this, because like it's really it gets it gets really weird and stuff to like uh, to understand it. But we all know that Flash basically kind of becomes the Flash because of Reverse Flash in a way, right? Right. So, right, it, like the Flash Barry Allen's origin starts years ago when he was a kid. Like uh, he sees like lightning and stuff in his house 
and uh, his basically someone kills his mother. And mm-hmm. this person, whoever did it at the time, we didn't know it was Thon, uh, basically framed Barry Allen's father. Right. So his father goes to prison for years for uh, supposedly killing his mother when Barry knew it wasn't him. So Barry spends his whole entire life trying, you know, he so much so he becomes uh, a crime scene investigator. Right. And uh, working for uh, um, Central City so that he has he's acquiring all this knowledge and, you know, becoming a crime scene investigator so he could prove one day his father is innocent and get him out of jail. So literally, mm-hmm. much like you know Batman, when his parents died, he was set on this course to become Batman, train around the world. Barry Allen, almost pretty much the same thing, just in a different way. You know, he's like, all right, well, I know it wasn't my dad. He was wrongly acu- accused, so I'm going to spend my whole life, you know, becoming this uh, amazing crime scene investigator, this amazing detective, to prove one day that my dad didn't do it. And you know, even as he's working uh, for the CSI and all that stuff, he's. On, you know, you see it in the Flash TV show. You definitely see it in the comics. He has his own yeah. little charts oh, yeah. and stuff like that where he's on the side after work doing the stuff uh, for Central City Police Department that he's trying to solve his dad's case. And then, you know, this. So the crazy thing about this is years later, like we didn't find out that Thawne killed Barry's dad until, until Flash rebirth. And not the Flash rebirth from like DC rebirth, like the real OG Flash rebirth from Jeff Johns. Like for those of you who don't know, the term rebirth what for the this new DC rebirth that Johns and everything kicked off within the last three years or so was taken mm-hmm. from uh, stories that uh, Jeff Johns did earlier with Green Lantern, with Green Lantern Rebirth and Flash Flash Rebirth because he basically was like, yo, I did those. At the time, he was still chief creative officer at... Uh, DC, so he's like, I'm gonna take that and use that whole rebirth title, and you know, make that the new continuity going forward. Just to give some, just to give some uh, context there. Anyway, in Jeff Johns' Flash Rebirth run, it's revealed that all these years later, that Thon killed uh, Barry's mother, and and this amazing, sadistic, iconic line that I, I always repeat it because it just hits so close to home to me. He basically says. We, not basically he does says he goes i murdered your mother barry and it's his right it's his, and mm-hmm. barry you know you see barry and it's just all hits him that whoa if it wasn't for reverse flash he wouldn't have been set on this path that ultimately led him to become the flash you know what i mean because he wouldn't have been he wouldn't have been a crime scene investigator he wouldn't have been around those chemicals and all that stuff right. so but it's this weird kind of paradox thing because with time travel where it's like a little confusing because, you know, the Flash was the Flash before the reverse Flash. It's even weird to explain it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like I'm not even explaining it right. Again, just watch the history of episodes. Uh, but Because <laughs> <laughs> I know when we were doing those, it was, it was very specific on how we wrote all that out to make sure we said everything exactly. Because it's so hard to, t- to explain that stuff when talking about uh, time travel. Mm-hmm. But anyway, what I'm saying is... Um, I mean, the guy who killed your mother clearly is going to be like your arch nemesis, right? But it's just so cool because he's also a fan of the Flash. Like, he loves the Flash so much he wants to be the Flash, but in his own twisted way. And he keeps doing all this stuff. Like, we constantly see that he's, like, behind the strings of everything pretty much bad in the Flash's life. Like, spoiler alert, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler for Josh Williamson's Flash run. We also find out... You know, he's he he just killed Godspeed. Right. Like and Godspeed, you know, he was kind of behind that whole thing where Godspeed was, you know, once he not once, he was Barry's friend. He worked, you know, with him at uh um at the police department. So you, you find out like all these things like that Thon is always behind like the worst things in Barry Allen's life. So for me, that's the greatest rivalry. Just you know, I just that whole aspect. Plus Thon is a really complex character. He's just cool. He's very smart. Uh he he's fast. I don't know. I'm just a fan and uh and I like the Flash as well. So that's my number one pick. <laughs> that is a both a solid pick and a solid explanation. Ooh, thank of you. The pick. I will I will give that. I wish I could have done it better, uh, but again ten points. <laughs> ten points to Gryffindor. Again, I apologize for uh the whole like the whole explaining his origin thing it is it's like really weird because i remember remember when uh doing that episode i was like this is freaking like it it confused the heck out of me because we obviously we have to do like research for a lot of stuff like a lot of stuff we know obviously off the top of our heads but stuff like that 
it's so specific and it's so crazy with timelines and then even things change with revamped continuity and then like the paradoxes like i i remember uh telling him like i never want to do a reverse like i love reverse flash (laughs) but i never want to do an episode (laughs) explaining his continuity again because it is so difficult to keep everything in check (laughs) but i love him well every any time that you're dealing with time travel especially yeah uh your your things get Super, super crazy. For sure. Josh Williamson did a really good job at kind of cleaning it up uh, recently in his Flash uh, Rebirth one. I'm several issues behind on that run, but uh, I did mm-hmm. read enough when he was kind of going through the whole re explaining uh, uh, Thon's origin, and it was pretty dope. So I highly recommend uh, actually reading that issue. I don't know the name of the issue uh, or the issue number, rather, but uh, we talked about it in an episode. Again, just go to Variant, type in Reverse Flash. And you'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Literally, that's all you have to do. And everything uh, reverse flash related will come up. <laughs> One of them will be there. Yeah. Easy, easy PC. But you're you're up. You're up. What's your, what's your first one? Okay. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm trying to decide. I'm trying to decide which one I want to go with. Because I'm. Okay. I'm going to go. I guess. Are we doing like number one first? I didn't do it in any. Is that. I didn't do it in any order. I just, you know. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't do like, okay, this is two and this is three. No. Although, although the reverse flash one might, mm, no, I don't, I don't, it I don't, be your number two. I don't know. I don't want to say it. Cause I, I don't, also don't want to give away what my second one is, but well, no, you don't have to do it in order. <laughs> okay. All right. So then I'm going to, I'm going to do, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do the most, I guess you could say kind of cliche, but obvious one. Uh, but it is one of my uh, favorites, aside from Batman Joker, which is going to be Superman and Lex Luthor. Uh, it, it is just obviously mm-hmm. one of the most iconic uh, hero-villain rivalries in all of comics. For it's sure. one of the oldest uh, hero-villain rivalries of all of comics. There's a reason that uh, both each individual character in the rivalry um, has just stood the test of time and has just been a part of just an almost a seemingly endless number of incredible stories throughout DC Comics history. Um, but the rivalry between these two, the thing that really stands out to me and makes it interesting and compelling is the fact that you are dealing with a human being who uses his intelligence, his wit, um, and just sheer cunning uh, to be an endless pain in the butt <laughs> right. for essentially a god. I mean, to the to the point to where, I mean, he's almost killed Superman on numerous mm-hmm. occasions. Um, and Superman is constantly having to look over his shoulder at where's Lex? What is he doing? Um, and there's that that dynamic of Lex Luthor always also feeling like he's doing humanity a service. Right. Yes. He always thinks that Superman is a danger ultimately to humanity and to the world, Uh, just like he does, you know, just like he thinks that everything that he does and him being in power is in the best interest of humanity and the world. It just so happens to line up with his own power and and wealth as well Mm. (laughs) and him enriching himself. But he's so narcissistic. And he's he is so self deluded, um, and you know wrapped up in his own brilliance that he genuinely thinks that the best thing for the planet would be if he just is in is, is in charge of everything for sure, right? And we know for a fact we you know those people really do exist in the world. We 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 have some of them in actual position, heavy positions of power now, <laughs> right? No, Where they just think no, that, we don't. Yeah, I know it's a I know that's a shocking revelation to everyone, uh, but. He kind of it really embodies that idea of there are people who just are, they're so narcissistic and self-absorbed um, that no matter what they do, no matter what they think, no matter how uh, just wicked or vile or um, how crushing they are to um, uh, people, how, how many people get hurt in the process, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, they think ultimately the ends justify the means mm-hmm. and, um, you know, what they think is right, that they're always doing it for the right reasons. And in the end, it's going to be for everybody's benefit. And that, that element of Lex Luthor then uh, pitted up against Superman, who is the embodiment of the greatest potential of what human humanity can be. Right. Yeah. Um, He, you know, even all of his powers, obviously, you know, he has godlike powers. He's an alien and all this kind of a thing. But, you know, it's kind of symbolic of what humanity could accomplish if we embraced, you know, fighting on the side of good, if we embraced the right ideals and principles and, you know, moral standing um, 
and, and worked and fought for each other and, and made that what humanity could accomplish together, right? So that's, there's like a, tons of symbolism there just in the, in the embodiment of Superman. And you have, so you have like these two countervailing, um, you know, embodiments of symbolism um, that are just in direct conflict with one another. And seeing those two uh, and how many different writers have expressed that and rolled those two dynamics out and, and, and just clashed them up against each other over the years is just one of the most fun uh, rivalries in all of comics without question. And again, it's the, there's a reason that it's lasted as long as it have. And I, I'm always taken, even going back to my very, 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 very early years as a kid, watching the the uh, Christopher Reeve oh, yeah, Superman yeah, yeah. films with Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor, right? Mm-hmm. Like he's like the the kind of the classic Lex Luthor in comics, right? Not the more modern iteration where he's more physical and uh, more conniving and and you know uh, he's a little bit more of a brute, yeah. Uh, and in, 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 on top of his intelligence. Uh, but you know, just that, just, I, I started loving that rivalry and the, the, the dynamic between those two characters all the way back then. And it's only grown throughout the year. So that would be my first pick for sure. No, that's, that's a really solid one. I think what you, you said there, it just being a fun rivalry, uh, says a lot, you know, for just all rivalries, right? Cause even to like the Barry Allen reverse flash one, like it's just, it's fun in the sense where it's not really fun for the hero, obviously, but it's fun being the reader and viewer to see like all, you know, seeing them put in these circumstances where it's like, how are you going to get out of that? Or, oh my God, I can't believe he just did that to, to him. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's, that's a big key of what makes a lot of these ri- rivalries uh, so good and stand the test of time, if you will. Yeah, and and, and the other thing I, I will mention really quickly um, that also I really love is the fact that Lex Luthor, he, like that element, the element of good and the thing that uh, really makes the two uh, dynamics between the two characters really stand out even more is the fact that Superman, because he chooses to make sacrifices and do hard things, um, that, you know, fly in the face of the way Lex Luthor approaches things. Lex Luthor kind of, not just thinks he Superman is, you know, wrong or misguided. He kind of despises him for it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's that element to where it's almost like they they use that to play off the character where he has, you know, he despises him for the for for the fact that Superman is able to to make choices that just aren't in his makeup. For sure, for sure. You know what I mean? I, I lo- just all those elements I really love. It's it's fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I t- completely agree with you. And something I didn't mention earlier that was kind of obvious as far as the reverse flash uh flash rivalry is he's literally the reverse flash, right? So it just makes all the, he's like yeah, the complete yeah. and utter opposite of what Barry is and that's kind of what makes for the best villain usually, right? When being the the complete you know, another opposite of what that hero stands for, much mm-hmm. like the Joker and Batman, where Batman has a strict moral code. He saves people, doesn't kill. Joker is like on the complete opposite end of that spectrum. Same thing <laughs> <laughs> with Barry, uh, Barry Allen and Reverse Flash. And not only that, um, what's really cool is Flash created the Speed Force, right? Barry Allen created the Speed Force. He has his own Speed Force. Reverse Flash has mm-hmm. the negative Speed Force, which is his own a Speed Force. So it's this really cool where they're literally just the reverse of each other and have like you know you know their own speed forces and all that stuff. It's so much funny though. Like mm-hmm. this is getting uh, super nerdy. But talking about toys and stuff, I always got mad as a kid when you they would make Reverse Flash uh, toys and they put the lightning bolt on his chest the, in the same direction that Barry's is pointing when it's supposed to be oh, yeah, the right. reverse because he's Reverse Flash. Yeah. So exactly, that, that, yeah. that always bugged me. I'm like, no, no, that's not that's not Reverse Flash. That's Flash <laughs> in a yellow costume. <laughs> Well, that's that speaks to your continuity. Yeah, right. so. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, let's give my second and final pick is kind of an obvious one, a very, very popular one. And that is going to be Peter Parker and Norman Osborn, a.k.a. Yes. Spider-Man and the Green Goblin. This one is, you know, it's just so iconic and it's so such a twisted, messed up relationship. You just have to if you've seen the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies, you know enough to know how complex it is. Where Peter Parker, his best friend, is Harry Osborn. Mm-hmm. Uh, Harry Osborn's father is Norman Osborn, who is Spider-Man's arch enemy because Norman Osborn is the Green Goblin. And when I think of this relationship, he again, the Green Goblin has done some evil, evil stuff to Peter over oh, the yeah. years. We actually did uh, uh, an episode on it, I believe, uh, the Green Goblin's most evilest moments. And he's done some stuff. Like, he, he tricked... Uh, Spider-Man into thinking his parents were alive again 
uh, only to be like, psych, they're really that's not they're not real. Those are those are uh, those are clones slash robots. Yeah, I just wanted to trick you to torture you. Your parents are still dead. So like stuff like <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, but the one I always think of, which is easily one of the most iconic uh, moments in all of comic book history, not even Spider-Man or Marvel history, is when Green Goblin killed Gwen Stacy on the Brooklyn Bridge. Yes. You know, every Iconic. Yeah, if you read comic books or know anything about Spider-Man, you know about this, and that's for a reason. Because at the time, like, n- that was that was like a shift in, like, t- you know, in storytelling in comics, right? Mm-hmm. So, Because at the time, you didn't really... Stuff like that wasn't done. Like, you didn't kill a major character or a love interest, especially in that way. Like, we're talking about her neck literally snapped. And you could... In, and it was done in such a, a way... Where, yes, it was the Green Goblin, because the Green Goblin is the one who pushed her off the bridge, but Peter blamed himself because when he's, he put his web line out to catch her, it was the sudden stop that broke her neck, that snapped her neck. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it was, it, was, it was done in that way where, yes, the Green Goblin killed her, but you could argue, and Peter blamed him, and, you know, Peter even blamed himself that, you know, was it me? Did I, did I do it? Because, you know, that sudden stop, you know, if you, maybe if you would have saved her a different way, you know, you, she still would be alive, but it was such a big deal. And that was his first love. You know, I know obviously Mary Jane is the very popular love interest. I mean, I guess more, more so because of the Spider-Man movies, people do know a lot about Gwen Stacy now, but Gwen Stacy was like, that's the OG uh, love interest for Spider-Man. So right, right. that almost that moment alone, I feel like is enough to cement it. Uh, but then even like the stuff I said where, you know, tricking him into thinking his parents, uh, his parents were uh, were alive and all that stuff. And then, and then, and then, this one is the kicker because this is tied to, this is tied to the whole Gwen Stacy thing. Years later, I forget what the name of the writer or what writer it was, but it was revealed that Green Goblin not only like inevitably killed Gwen Stacy, but also raped her. Right. Right. So there was all this, you know, this stuff that they added to it. A lot of fans rejected it because they're like, too far, bro. A lot of fans were also, it was very polarizing. Some fans were like, oh, no, that just cements how freaking evil he was. So, yeah. But just, you know, he did all, he does all these things over the course of Spider-Man's history to really, like, hit him where it hurts. You know what I mean? He's, you know, kidnapped Aunt May, who's, you know, that's like, that's Peter's mother for all, you know, it's his aunt, but that's his, you know, his living mother for all, you know, uh, extensive purposes and stuff like that. So Green Goblin, Spider-Man, all day long, I think, you know, those reasons are far more than enough to cement why, you know, it's such a sadistic, good rivalry. And it's been, you know, it's one of the, much like Batman, Joker, Superman, Lex, you got Spider-Man, Green Goblin. It's it's a classic for a reason. And being the big Spider-Man fan that I am, easily, easily uh, makes its way on this list. Plus, you know, Peter looked up to like Norman, you know? I mean, he's the head of Oscorp and stuff like that. They're both extremely smart. Right. So it's kind of one of those things where you find out like your mentor or person you look up to is actually your arch nemesis. You just didn't know it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So very, very compelling yeah. stuff and definitely one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, and it kind of falls. It's like it's obviously, uh, I think the relationship between those two characters is significantly darker than Superman <laughs> right. and uh, Lex Luthor. Right. Uh, but uh, I do think like in terms of its iconic nature, it's it's similar in that way. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's always telling, like, we were talking a little bit before we uh, started doing this, but it's always telling, like, because there's lots of cool, like, heroes out there, right? Like, but not all of them have just as cool villains, like Iron Man. You know what I mean? You would think Mandarin, right? That's Mm -hmm. kind of the first one that comes to mind. But you can't compare him to, like, the Joker, Lex Luthor, or Green Goblin. Like, he's not in the same class. Same thing with Captain America. You would think Red Skull. Red Skull, yes, is highly popular. He's been around for decades and decades. But again, he's not in that same, like, as well-known or has as many good stories as, like, you know, Green Goblin, the Joker, and stuff like that. Now, I know there's going to be like the diehard Red Skull and Mandarin fans are like, what are you talking about? You clearly never read this storyline. I'm just, I'm not saying they don't have good storylines. I'm just saying the amount of story and, uh, you know, just even reception from fans in general over the years can't compare to, you know, some of these big these big rivalries. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And like we said, there's a reason that these these rivalry, these iconic rivalries have uh, just lasted for decades. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they f- just keep finding new ways to make them fresh and fun and new um, and expand them even further. So they're, they're on the list for a reason. Right. <laughs> All right. So my num- my final one, just to wrap up our top four, I guess you say you would say past uh, Batman Joker. Mm-hmm. Um, I For me, this one is, it's also an iconic 
uh, rivalry, but it's probably a not going to be on the top list for a lot of people. Um, some it will for sure. Mm. Um, but it is uh, Magneto and Doc and Professor X. That's a good one. No, that that's definitely going to be on the top for some people. That is a solid freaking rivalry for sure. <laughs> for sure. I'm just saying, there's a lot of other big rivalries right. uh, in comics that you could go to. You could even go to, or you know, the Spider Man Doc Ock back. You know, Spider Man Venom is another one that you could go to. I mean, there's just a lot of of big rivalries that you could call mm-hmm. out. Um, that I'm saying that this might fall in the middle for some people. Right. Um, but for me, for a lot of the, and look, kind of, let me just break it down. I, I have to start by breaking down my, why I like each individual character. Um, and then that, why I think that they're the combination of the two, uh, for me makes it so compelling. And in some ways it is similar to why I like Superman and Lex Luthor. Um, so with Magneto, you have that really awesome backstory. In my opinion, one of the better backstories of all in all of comics, mm-hmm. uh, where he, you know, he was he he was born in, in Germany, and uh, you know he you know went through the Holocaust um, uh, in Nazi Germany in Auschwitz, um, and he survives it. And he's got these powers and he doesn't know what to do with them. He's a kid and he finds a way to, you know, to escape all of that. And, you know, even with all of this anger, as far as losing his family and the whole deal, he managed to make a life for himself with a wife and a child. And, um, you know, the, the, the reactions to him having powers, he tries to hide mm-hmm. it, um, but it gets exposed and uh, in the process, long story short, his wife and his daughter get killed um, and he wipes out like an entire village. Yeah. I mean, it just turns him down a completely different path. Mm-hmm. Magneto, um, he changes his name. Magneto starts to emerge um, in, in his mind. That is, he starts to see that this like he starts to take on the belief that humanity and mutants can't coexist right at that at that moment. Uh, but then he goes uh, to Israel and then he's part of this scientific program. And that's where he meets Professor X for the first time. And then contrastly, you have Professor X who grew up. Uh, he had this power and he his father dies as, he, as at a young age. And, uh, you know, he has this really complex relationship with his stepbrother, uh, Kane Marco. Um, and, and just the he has, juggernaut and he comes into all <laughs> the juggernaut, everyone. Yes. Uh, but he has all of this turmoil, you know, that goes on in his life that kind of carries him where he's, he experiences similar issues, mm-hmm. um, of just, you know, the, the, the prejudice and the, the bias against, um, uh, mutants. And these two come together, uh, in, in this scientific program in Israel and, you know, each gives, they see in each other a kindred spirit. Right. Yeah. They see they they kind of they reveal to each other that they are mutants. They're each of them are mutants. Uh, Charles obviously recognizes it first because of his uh, telepathic abilities. So he recognizes that this is a, a fellow mutant. He has capabilities here and they they, you know, kind of they reveal each other's abilities and they see in each other a kindred spirit, so, uh, someone who can maybe help them get past the things that they've been through mm-hmm. and and move things in a positive direction. Um, but as things progress and various things take place and they see different things, um, they come to find out that their worldview is very different. It's very different and it's not compatible and they just start to splinter. But, and this is the part that is so compelling for me, is that they have these similarities. They want the same thing but they think they have to do different things to accomplish it. Yep. It's very interesting. And it is. And they see, they still continue to see each other almost as brothers. Mm-hmm. And so neither will really take action to really strike down the other because they still respect and care about the other one, but they each thinks the other is completely misguided in terms of what the priorities should be, what's the most important, and what are the necessary steps to achieve it. And it just speaks so much. They... You know, there's this is true throughout the X Men stories, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, where they re- they just really tap into a lot of you know uh, racial political issues and things like that, um, and uh, you know just social issues that you know are are all throughout humanity and our history. Um, but that relationship between those two, you know, it, it also speaks a lot to a lot of the reasons that I also like the Hulk, right? Uh, Bruce Banner Hulk. 
is that conflict, right? Of the, these are things that we really do wrestle with uh, when we face the various challenges in humanity and our behaviors and things that go on around the world. And, you know, what is the right way to handle a situation? And, you know, the, the, the care we have to take not to give in to, you know, hatred mm-hmm. and, uh, and anger and allow that to govern our actions and just so many different elements, but that ongoing back and forth to where Charles goes on to form the X-Men and and Magneto goes on to form the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. And each of them are seeking, right, freedom mm-hmm. and, and a future for their kind. But one thinks they, they, they ha- the only way to achieve it is through the destruction of humanity. And the other one thinks, no, there's a better way um, we can coexist. And, and, you know, there's, there's a peaceful solution here and we have to find that because two wrongs don't make a right. And it's just that clashing of those, those two uh, incompatible worldviews that just make that relationship and the storylines so compelling as is like, like I said, as I was, uh that, that those themes are just all throughout X-Men oh, for sure. uh, lore and history. I think the X-Men universe, this rivalry and just the X-Men universe in general is one of the most relatable to real world you know, situations Absolutely. and politics and stuff like that. Cause I mean, that's what Stanley and everyone was kind of pulling from, right? Like the mm-hmm. using inspiration from all that real world stuff. And it's still, it's, it still holds up today. And you could even argue more so now than ever. And it's just amazing to, you know, that they, they just, they both want both of, you know, their kind to be like accepted and free. They're just going about it in different ways. Mm-hmm. Right. You could almost say like, you know, in the sense, like, you know, Charles Xavier is the Martin Luther King, to uh uh the uh Magneto's Malcolm X. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know what question. I mean. Oh, oh like it's t- kind of totally what they were going for there, and it's but you know just with superpowers and mutants and fiction, and it's so so well done. You know, it's one of those timeless kind of tales and you know rivalries that you could keep retelling it and find new ways. And you know, I agree with you 100. percent It's it's funny. Like the X Men have always been popular, but I feel like you know in recent years there's been like a, a new surge of their popularity and people like, you know, you know, loving them and reading them more and stuff like that. Again, the X-Men have always been extremely popular. Mm -hmm. They had some of the first superhero movies, cartoons, but I've kind of noticed like, uh, you know, within the comic book community, just a little uptick, which is really interesting. I mean, I I love the X-Men, so it's not shocking. Yeah, absolutely not. And and you're 100% right. The the comparison of Malcolm X versus Dr. King is a great, is a great example of exactly what I'm talking about. And you know, I, you know me, I, I am always someone who is very fascinated by the philosophical and, and moral uh, wranglings of, of humanity and, and our history and, you know, uh, the things that, you know, human beings deal with on a day-to-day basis, the choices that we have to make, the challenges that we face and, uh, you know, the morals and the principles and the, and the decisions that we make and why, uh, that stuff is always super fascinating to me, which, uh, you know, many of you in the audience can probably tell that by a lot of the things that I talk Mm -hmm. about and why I like certain characters. Um, but it's just the X-Men just in general is rife, uh, with all of that. And the, um, the relationship between, uh, Magneto, and and Professor X, I think, is it kind of embodies it as a whole in such a, a profound For way. For sure. I, I absolutely love it. And I did want to, I, I forgot earlier, I had to mention this when I was talking about the whole uh, Gwen Stacy, Green Goblin uh, thing, uh, sleeping together. Well, one, I did want to make it clear, it wasn't really like rape, rape per se. It's kind of one of those things where it's ambiguous. She like slept with him because she wanted to, but like it's kind of insinuated that maybe something else is going on there. Yeah. But besides that, I did want to mention she became pregnant with twins. So not only did, did right. uh, Norman Osborn sleep with Gwen Stacy, Peter's girlfriend, he also impregnated her. Yeah. So I just I, I feel like I had to add that because that just kind of it yeah. pushes it that and, much further. <laughs> yeah. And no matter which way you slice it, it's yeah, bad. it's bad for, for sure. <laughs> it, it's no bueno. But I, I think I think what we could all agree on is that every one of our picks is pretty solid. And I think the entire, you know, the audience variant nation would definitely agree, at least for the most part, because these are these are definitely uh, characters that ha- have become quite popular over the, the last few decades, to say the least. Without any <laughs> doubt. Yeah. And, and be sure to let us know uh, in the comments section. Uh, be sure to let us know or tweet to us or whatever, uh, however you want to let us know uh, what your top rivalries are in comics. We would love to hear from you guys on it. And in the future, uh, we might do another one of these where we kind of uh, break down a few more of these rivalries because there's, there's just so, so many and they're all really fun to get into. For sure. I feel like, th- th- well, I'm not, I'll save it, but there was one I really wanted to do 
which I thought was really interesting. And he's an in, it's an indie comic, so it's not like a DC or Marvel character, but uh, it's uh, it's quite right. a it's quite a rivalry to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> as as there are right, but like you just said, uh, we definitely want to know what your what uh, all of your thoughts are. And I'm sure like it's so funny like when we say this stuff towards the ends of episodes and stuff, we're like we want to know what you guys think or let us know what your list would be. That when going back and reading the comments, I'm always like, dang it, I forgot that one. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so true. <laughs> what we're trying to say is that in the end, you guys are smarter than we are. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> but with that said, guys, we'll see you next time when we talk about all things comics. 